Oh, are we live? Yeah, we're live. <laughs> we got to start. Uh, so, um, Nara Mang Yindugi, Nathan Sen Shiwundu, Yinda Maledu Garago Nurumbang, Yinda Maledu Garago Mujigangu. Um, welcome, friends, to Digital Archives and Disruption. Um, before we start this session, I would like to acknowledge the land I'm currently on is the land of the Gadigal people, the unceded land of the Gadigal people. And I'd like to pay my respects to their elders, past and present, and recognize no matter what happens on this land, no matter what is built on this land, that it always was and always will be Aboriginal land. And I think even when we're moving into this digital space, it's important that the practices that we do honor and respect the First Nations knowledges and peoples of the lands we're on, especially in colonized countries. Um, my name is Nathan um, Muji Sentence. Um, I'm a Wiradjuri man. Um, my pronouns are he, him. Um, I'm from the Mogi clan of um, Mudgee, New South Wales. And I'm a librarian, archival archivist, and museum educator. And I'm joined in this discussion with the two very awesome people, um, Robert Ames um, and uh, Lucas um, La Rochelle. And um, I'm going to take this opportunity to give a quick definition of archives for those who are joining us who may be unfamiliar. And I'm gonna use the International Council of Archives definition, which you know people can disagree with, but it's a pretty broad and sort of um, basic understanding of archives. So archives are the document, um, documentary, a byproduct of human activity retained for long-term value. They are contemporary records created by individuals and organizations as they go about their business and therefore provide a direct window into past events. Um, they come in a wide range of formats, including the written, photographic, moving image, sound and digital and analog. Archives are held by public and private institutions and individuals around the world. So yeah, that's pretty broad, but that's a definition for archives for those who may not be familiar with the concept. Um, so considering the archive, what I might ask Rob and Lucas to do is um, if you would be able to introduce yourself, um, the land that you're on and um, your relationship to archives. Shall I start? <laughs> um, I'm Robin. My pronouns are they, them. Um, I'm a poet and historian. I'm currently <laughs> starting a PhD um, that's looking at trans mad histories and histories of pathologization in late 19th century, early 20th century Australia. I'm currently on also on Gadigal land of the Yoruba people. Um, whose sovereignty was never ceded. And I also think it's really important to keep that in mind when we're researching and when we're sort of positioning ourselves to speak with any kind of authority, um, like also in digital spaces as well, and not to divorce ourselves from the land and its history and its people. Um, my relationship with the archive is, largely state archives. It's with my research, I'm looking at medical histories. I'm going to the state archives in New South Wales and Victoria and looking at um, lunatic asylum records, uh, medical case books, patient registers, court records, arrest records, looking for people who cross gender categories and were pathologized and understood within a narrative of madness connected to to the act of gender transgression. Hi everyone, I'm Lucas La Rochelle. I'm a multidisciplinary designer, artist, and researcher. Um, and my work is concerned broadly with queer geographies, um, community-based archiving, and critical internet studies. Um, and I live and am currently located in Jojage, um, Muniang, otherwise known as Montreal which is the unceded territory of the Ganyangahaga nation. And it has historically been known as a, or has historically been a meeting place um, for numerous indigenous nations in this part of Turtle Island. And my relationship to the archive um, is predominantly through um, building an archive. So I'm the, the founder of Queering the Map, which is a community generated Countermapping project that um, digitally archives queer experience in relation to physical space. Deadly. And our, our discussion today was titled Digital Archives and Disruption. And um, I'm wondering 
with the practices you do or your interaction with the archives or even just thinking about archives in themselves, what do you think, how do you, what does disruption mean to you? Like, what are we trying to disrupt or how do you feel like you are participating in a disruption? I think with state archives in particular, there's this massive misconception that they are objective and neutral and that what is kept by the archive just sort of happens to be there when in fact it's a it's a deeply curated space and the records that are kept are often about management and surveillance about control of certain populations about presenting an image of the past that is how I mean, with regard to state records, how the colony wants to represent itself and remember itself. And the state records that are kept, they don't keep everything. They keep what is considered of historical value, but the construction of historical value is one that is shaped by the state and and its motives and not just by people and the not even by the people whose records are kept by the archive. Um, and disruption in that sense, I actually, I struggle quite a lot with wondering when I'm perpetuating some of that sort of surveilling gaze, particularly when it comes to studying marginalized history, people who were considered deviant, who were recorded in quite hostile ways through a very hostile lens and Disruption in that sense, I think, is about disrupting the the motives of the state archives, I suppose, trying to sort of get something back from them, trying to recover the voices of the people who are kept there, the ghosts who are kept there, and I guess trying to resist the the marginalizing structures that, that led to what is kept by the archive. Yeah, and I think that's that's really cool because like, I think I think it, that's even possible just by making visible some of those motives. Um, and uh, as you're saying, like discussing the fact that these spaces are not neutral in of itself can kind of be disruptive because, you know, the sort of things that are embedded in like, especially state institution archives, colonial archives is sort of like, you know, colonialism, whiteness, patriarchy, all these sorts of things, you know, heteronormativity are all embedded into these archives, but they're embedded so much that they seem like they're the natural way of things. Like the art, yep. this, is, this is just because if you create an archive in any way, this is naturally how it will turn out. And I think a lot of archivists within um, archives from my experience actually believe this. And because of this, archives themselves portray themselves to the public as that and it sort of, you know, reproduces this narrative. So I think just even like making visible some of those, um, the things that are embedded in archives can be disruptive. And and Lucas, with what you do, um, how do you, like, because you're creating an archive. Mm -hmm. um, so your disruption is quite different. Like, um, and how, what, what do you reckon about that? <laughs> Um, yeah, I mean, when, when I was thinking about how disruption plays into this work, the, the, the primary starting point um, is thinking about how to disrupt the map, um, or thinking about queering as disrupting, queering as, as breaking the map. So thinking about, so queering the map is a, um, it's a mapping platform, and it takes the, the, ver the visual vernacular of, of Google Maps, um, but removes uh, certain functionalities. So for example, a search bar to query location um, and replaces those functionalities with um, the ability to add on to or annotate the map. Um, in, in the case of querying the map, those annotations being queer experience, um, however one might define that. Um, and so uh, the, way that I, the way that I think about disruption on, on querying the map is um, both in terms of the the infrastructure um, or the the way in which people are interacting with this sort of off, a very closed system. So for the most part, one cannot, um, when one is encountering um, Google Maps, for example, there's a specific set of uh, actions that one can take um, and a certain kind of story that is portrayed through the map itself um, that also portrays itself um, as or comes across or is uh, 
intended or is set up um, to be neutral, which of course we know it's not. Um, and, and so part of my, my thinking around this project and how disruption plays into this project specifically as it grows um, is around the ways uh, that the pins, so stories are pinned onto the map and these black pins begin, begin to um, make, uh, make opaque what is underneath them. So they begin to disrupt the, the image of the map underneath. And at the same time, because of the overloading of data on the site, the map underneath it also begins to break. Um, and so it's revealed as an image um, rather than any sort of um, purveyor of, of truth. That's real deadly and that's, um, it's very cool. And I like that idea of like disrupting the map because again itself, even like a map, like things, just even things like naming of places and maps are sort of portrayed as neutral in themselves. And um, again, like we're, we're gonna be talking lots about the digital, but like your digital really does connect to the physical land, like actual physical landscapes. And mm -hmm. like, um, I think there's a tendency to think of archives as solely sort of like record based sort of things, but your like, and yours is because they enter that digital world, but they are like human experiences from people connected to particular places. And like, um, if you were to sort of think about your sort of mapping thing, then those places, if you were to visit those places, they are sort of part of the archive and they're an archive and history sort of teller themselves. Yeah, so that's, mm -hmm. it's, it's sort of very cool. And um, so, and even thinking about the digital space, um, Robin, so you use um, archives and I've seen you go to physically to, um, for your Instagram, go to, you know, um, state archives, um, state records, New South Wales and state archives in Victoria. But, um, what do you think is the main differences with the physical and digital? And is there any sort of, um, do you have a sort of a preference? And then also to, do you feel that there are like, there's of course like benefits and detriments to both, but what are the ones that you sort of experience in your experience? I think primarily it's a question of access um, because digitization of records and digital projects are, by nature, a lot more open, a lot more free. You know, you can um, access them from home, which as a researcher, as a disabled researcher in particular, um, it makes a huge difference not having to trek out to the archive, which are often like the um, the state archives, the, the buildings themselves are often in keeping with access standards, but it's difficult to get out there. They're often the New South Wales one in Sydney in particular is located out in Western Sydney in an area that's not easy to get to even for people in Western Sydney. Um, and the, the sort of public transport and everything is a bit horrifying. Um, but the archives in person it's a really different experience because you're kind of like just going and getting these books and records and boxes of files that you don't really know what's going to be in there often the ways that they're catalogued aren't very transparent um aren't very detailed because there is just such a huge body of records and Going through them in person, I think sometimes you feel more of a connection to what it is that you're going through. Um, whereas in digital spaces, often things are really divorced from their context. Um, and in particular, in Australia, we've got Trove, which is this fantastic resource of uh, maintained by the National Library of Australia, which is digitized archival records, primarily digitized newspaper records. Um, going back centuries and the the difference there is that because of the OCR tech that's used to digitize them you can keyword search when you're going through looking for records whereas without that before that you had to just kind of like read every single newspaper you know, for hundreds of years to try and find what you were looking for. And if you didn't know what you were looking for and when and where, it was really difficult. But looking into trans history, being able to do that keyword search, searching for people's names, searching for phrases like, you know, living as a man, posing as a man, um, 
you know, poser is definitely a gender. Um, but it really changes the way that we access and find the records. And with trans history, finding it is so much of the problem because it's been suppressed, because by the very nature of what it is that you're looking for, people were trying to hide, were trying to sort of pass into a category without, you know, being known by the community. Um, and often we only find out about these cases in coronial inquests after people die or when they came into contact with some kind of institution like an asylum, like the courts. Um, so we get these really filtered views. Um, and when things are sort of maintained in, in digital space, I think you have to be really careful to still consider things within their context because the language that's used around them, you know, if you just keyword search and find a case of someone who is assigned female and living as a man and then it's represented in the newspapers, it's like, oh, this is extraordinary. We've never seen anything like this before. You know, this is so, you know, you might think on the surface like, oh, this was really a big deal for the community. But 19th century newspapers just kind of talked about everything like that. They were real dramatic about uh, really simple things. So it's important to keep looking at the surrounding records in a way that you're forced to do in the physical archive because you can't keyword search for stuff. You have to like flip through every page of the case book or whatever to find what it is that you're looking for. Mm -hmm. I'm I'm so excited about what you just brought up and and are adding are adding so much to um, one of the the central components of querying the map and one of the things that I've been writing and thinking about in regards to this project specifically around um, not having a search bar. So what it means to have an archive, a digital archive um, that you can't search through using things like keywords, even using things like locations, though of course one can drag oneself across the map to find those things, but to find them in their context. Um, and that decision to not include a search bar for keywords is a very intentional one, and there's multiple reasons for it, but one of them is um, thinking about the intimacy of uh, the physical archive, what it means to go to a library searching for one, or, an, or a physical archive searching for one thing, and in the process of looking, getting lost and finding something else. And so I'm, I'm thinking about that as sort of a, a method of, of, of um, doing queer in the archive, doing queer research, um, and, and having a propensity towards being lost. Um, though I love what you're saying, uh, because it's also sort of tethering. Um, I gave a talk the other day, and I opened this, this section of my talk by saying that I'm um, pretty, pretty convinced that search bars are evil. Um, <laughs> Specifically thinking about, and I don't have the full thesis on that written. But, <laughs> um, Work in progress. And and specifically thinking about like the role of the algorithm in in relationship to the search bar and how that itself becomes a filtering yeah. process. But I lo I so love what you're saying, and and I'm and I'm going to um, incorporate that into my thinking about also when you're trying to find things that have been intentionally hidden, the role of the search bar. Uh, the role of keywords and metadata in that process of finding the things that perhaps we we need to find. There's an urgency to find those kinds of history. But, and I, but even then as well, um, there's with OCR tech, it often doesn't, um, it creates these sort of garbled records, often really misspelt. So you have to be really careful for if you search for something and then you find a certain number of records to keep in mind, that's not everything that's there, even with regard mm -hmm. to that particular keyword, because there'll be all these other records where it's, it's misspelt and it hasn't been corrected yet. Um, mm -hmm. And I think that's a real pitfall to be aware of as well, is to not assume that what you're looking at is all that is there, or even if you are looking at, um, you know, the the records in a in a really expansive way, to keep in mind that it's a fraction of of the actual lives and communities in the past. 
um, and the you know, we really only get glimpses and we get glimpses that are filtered through structures that were designed to obscure or manage or reinterpret or reintegrate marginalized people and, you know, deviant bodies into the mainstream. Uh, um, um, and I always think about that, like, with, um, with, because I work at the Australian Museum um, in Gadigal country. And I always think about like, just even like, and this is slightly different to an archive, but I even think about, but it, there's some functionality that's the same with like taxonomies and classification. And I always think about like, uh, you know, uh, we have all these sort of First Nation shields from all across Australia, but we have a, like, we actually have this large like New South Wales collection. And all the shields are put together because they're shields and they were called shields because an anthropologist, when they entered the collection, define them that way and that imposes sort of a meaning onto them like you know when people think of shields they think of something to defend themselves but like I know in like the Wiradjuri language there's at least and these are only the words I know there's at least six different words for shield and not met, like not one of them sort of actually refers to sort of defending yourself you know what I mean but um, mm. now be, by being renamed they sort of get reinterpreted and I think that can happen similar to when you enter the archive and um, I, I also think from like a First Nations perspective, talking about like the search bar, like First Nations communities already think of like archives, like the buildings that they're housed in and the archives themselves as sort of like impenetrable and like archivists themselves as gatekeepers. And I think to a certain extent, like the search bar may seem more accessible, but some people probably will see it as again, just another gatekeeper or as um, Robin was sort of uh, like talking about, is it, it can kind of trick you because like again you you um i always think about how the way like my dad would search for things and he would search for things very different to say like an archivist would search for things so if my dad was to search the archive for say things that relate to radri language his first reaction would be like radri language and nothing would come up and my dad would then assume that the archive has nothing related to radri language mm -hmm. And that's sort of what would happen. And, um, and then my dad would just dis be discouraged and think that there's no language material in these particular archives. So I think there is like, there is that thing with the search bar where it's like it, and again, it is that fraction. It's also still the fraction of what's there because um, I know that lots of archives have boxes of boxes of material that they've only made brief records to. And even then their records are, even if you look at colonial archives, they are still just a fraction because they are curated. So there are many records mm. that they keep. And there's even like, you know, I previously worked with the Kitchener Boys Home, which was like a mission um, out in Kempsey. And um, the uncles out there swear that the day that the mission closed, they saw missionaries taking boxes of files to the river and chucking them into the river. So mm. if, if that's the case, then you it's like hard to um, it's hard to state that the archives are not uh, like history, like they are just that sort of fraction of history. Mm. Um, but I think that's always like when people talk about archives, they usually talk about accountability and transparency. Like, and um, I was wondering, because you mm. are the builder of the archive, Lucas, how do you embed sort of like accountability and transparency in like sort of the work you do? Mm -hmm. I. I was thinking something before you answered that question, and I'm gonna to try to answer answer the question from this tendril of thought that emerged when sure. you were um, speaking. Um, but I was I was thinking about, oh my God, and now I just lost it. Where did it go? <laughs> um, oh, I was thinking about, so I'm connecting that question to the first question of disruption um, and, and thinking specifically, like, is part of disruption illuminating and making visible um, structures as an act. So for example, the like the illumination of um, the structure of missionaries dumping files out into the river is a necessary component for understanding, you know, how, mon how one might encounter that particular archive and what is missing, but without the understanding of what is missing and how it goes missing, one can't have a total understanding of um, the structure or the history of that space and the information that is made available in that space. Um, so I'm so I'm kind of connecting that question back to disruption. So is is the illumination of a structure um, an act of disruption? Um, 
And then in terms of thinking about transparency in regards to, to my work on Queering the Map, um, I think part of that part of that strategy of transparency has has always been um, being very open with how Queering the Map uh, works. And, and, and it's the sort of, I mean, the story of Queering the Map and how it um, came to be is, I mean, for the past two years since I launched this project, I've done like numerous, numerous interviews and, and have gone from someone that, you know, didn't really speak publicly, had definitely never done an interview, was just sort of like verbal diarrhea, like this is what's happening, this is like, it, this happened and now I'm doing this and this happened and now I'm doing this um, and learning as I go along. Um, I'm, I think about, there's a podcast, um, oh, I forget what which podcast it is. I think the podcast is All My Relations. And uh, they are interviewing Dr. Kim Tallbear. Um, and Dr. Kim Tallbear says something to the effect of, um, uh, or is talking about the importance of failing in public. Um, and I think that she calls like failing in public a, a feminist ethic or a feminist act. Um, and I believe in that so strongly. I remember hearing that and feeling like someone was giving me a hug um, because this sort of, so, so for context, I launched Queering the Map, um, with the expert for myself and my immediate community. Um, and then it very, very, it, it gained attention in, in a period of like massive attention in a period of three days. Um, there was about 6,500 stories that were added in three days. And then it was spammed by Trump supporters because there was no moderation system in place because I had never intended it to grow that quickly. And so that's very much a part of the story of this, like this project went out into the world that was that was not, that was a prototype. Um, and then it was met with people after, after I had to take it down, cause I was like this, I, ah, what do we do? Um, then a, a group of people reached out um, to help me um, develop it into a state that it could be made sustainable to exist in the world. Um, and so that information, um, in terms of thinking about transparency, that information and, and the sort of history of this project from its very genesis um, is something that I uh, have always been very public about um, and and I think continue to be. I mean, I, I, I and thinking alongside this project as it grows and in, in many ways sort of like keeping up and um, and also thinking with a lot of, of different people. So people who come in, um, who approach me to um, do research on the project or to collaborate in some capacity on the project, um, trying to figure out a way to include the way that people are approaching and using this project in the way that it um, moves forward. Um, that would be, yeah, I, that's, that's where I, that's where my, my brain goes with thinking about, um, transparency in relationship to, to querying the map. I think and, so much of accountability as well, sorry, is, um, about contextualization and about making visible the things that we assume are invisible or default or that don't need to be said um, and in particular like how records come about how archives start how something entered the record why it was kept why it was catalogued in a particular way who is responsible for it who it is considered to belong to um, because the archive really rewrites what it keeps and I mean what you were saying earlier Nathan about um like the language of the archive and about searching for records, you really have to to learn the language of the institution in order to navigate it, which itself is such a barrier, but it also means that the the state archives kind of force you to work within their language and their parameters. And in the context of trans history, you can't search trans, you can't search transgender, the word transgender only started being used in the 1960s, you can't search 
transition you have to search for things like passing as a man, masquerading as a woman, um, imposture, uh, you know, deception is another word that really comes up and like slurs like man, woman, but that's how you find what you're looking for. But when you're, when you're finding it through this, you know, marginalizing language, I think it really shapes um, the way that you approach it and you, you really have to be aware of the ways in which you might, or, you know, I might be perpetuating that language, even when we then write about it critically, um, particularly when it comes to, you know, historical slurs, but also just historical ways of framing. Um, and so much of trans history has, if it has been covered at all by historians, it's been understood through the lens of queer history. And it's been understood as gender transgression as a manifestation of marginalized sexuality, but not marginalized gender. And in areas where these are really shared histories, um, and, and in times when the, the categories of queer and trans weren't really separable, we have a lot of cisgender queer historians looking back, trying to find their history and, you know, very admirably, but inadvertently imposing often really contemporaneous, um, contemporary ideas of the limitations of those categories and assuming that people in the past who crossed gender categories and lived in decades in a gender other than that which they were assigned were themselves more like how we would today understand cisgender queerness. Mm. And um, I was just wanting to ask you, Robin, like, because you, you've gone to the physical archives. Uh, I know we're meant to talk about digital archives, but I was just wondering, because I always, in like um, working with archivists, always wonder about like how much intervention archive archivists should um, portray, which I um, take part in. And I, I'm an advocate for some intervention. Like um, I'm also working at the University of Sydney um, Library and we have like a rare book collection and a, like a legacy theses collection. And uh, um, this is built on like anthropologists like research. And the University of Sydney is like the oldest um, university in Australia. So it has this large anthropological history of researching Aboriginal people and our culture and our history. And, you know, through particularly like, you know, use of like problematic language, but also just a problematic lens. And um, we need to provide access to that material because it has material within it that is useful for things like um, cultural vitalization. Like it, even if the anthropologist is like, an awful human being, they're still writing um, language words down, which we may need to take with a grain of salt with their interpretation. Um, anthropologists used to naturally simplify Aboriginal culture because they um, saw us as sort of, you know, uh, sort of simple or savage people. And um, another thing is like also to, to understand the history of where we are now, because um, that's the important thing about archives if you talk about them historically is they're not just disconnected from today. Like today we're, we're living in the legacy of some of the events that happened in those archives. So like with those um, historical books, um, we wanna provide access to them, but then we do again have that fear similar to what you were saying, Robin, is like, how do we stop people accessing them and then just replicating those views? Like, um, especially to like at a university, like say like undergrad students, how do we get them to critically engage with this material and then make sure that they have, um, you know, the, like understand the context of the, the material themselves and understand that there's, a, there's a many First Nations voices missing from this. Like it, this whole book might be about First Nations culture, but you'll, you, you won't find a named First Nations person throughout the book. And like to try to understand that. And so I'm wondering like what the archival role is with like intervention and that's in a digital and physical space. But I was also wondering, with you, because some of the material that you would have gone through could have been possibly traumatic. And, oh, yeah. Um, <laughs> it's and was, quite bad. <laughs> and I was wondering, did did any, like, archivists prepare, like, I know, like, you may have been prepared yourself, but did they any of them prepare you? Nope. Or take any sort of, like, 
care in the fact that like the archives can be sort of daunting and, and traumatic. Not at all. Not at all. And um, when you're requesting the archives through Public Record Office Victoria, some of the lunatic asylum records um, have kind of a tag that says some of this content may be upsetting, some of the language um, may be like not considered appropriate today in particular. Uh, people with intellectual disabilities were spoken about in terms of congenital uh, idiocy and imbecility um, and but there's really no attempt to um, contextualise or pull back against any of that language or any of that framing. They're just kind of presented as records. Um, I didn't have any um, really no com – like the only conversations I had with archivists were about collecting the records and about finding the records – um, I've been talking to my therapist about vicarious trauma, but that's like something I've done myself out of necessity. Um, and I think as well, it's maybe, I don't think people understand that, um, it's worse when you have a personal connection to, to what is kept to the records, um, and, I, I do really worry about people um, accessing the records without any context of, you know, disability, critical disability studies, critical MAD studies, any perspective that unravels the pathologization and marginalization, because in many ways we are still living in that legacy. A lot of these institutions were only um, what some of them are still around we've still got the the large residential centres that were supposed to be shut down 20 years ago um, and the history of institutionalisation for disabled and mad people is one that we are still living with and one that you can't act as if this is all in the past and oh what a sad thing or we know better now because we don't know better and we're still living with that legacy um, but I think it's really difficult as well because I think attempts to contextualise or, you know, situate the records in a way that acknowledges how harmful they are often just ends up as attempts to sanitise them oh. or to project yeah. contemporaneous ideas. And I was reading a, a book from the 1980s, um, which was an excellent book, but it was it had this footnote that was like, um, oh, you know, like here I've reproduced some of this language about imbeciles and idiots and you know I I don't wish to cause any offense to the mentally retarded and it's just like look at that now it's like that didn't age well that did not <laughs> age well at all yeah. <laughs> because um and now look at it in 2019 it's like all of these words are considered really awful slurs hmm. and if we attempt to and and that's how kind of um euphemistic drift happens um but trying to frame things in current language just doesn't age well. And particularly when it's something that's done from the outside by neurotypical able researchers who often really don't have that much of a connection to the community that they're researching. Um, I think that makes it really difficult to, to go about it in a responsible way. And I really wish that, um, yeah, I don't, I don't know what solutions there are, but like even just a sort of primer on like disability justice before you access the records or because, um, I mean, the vast majority of people in the physical archives doing archival research are doing family history. They're not scholars. Um, and that's something that I find really interesting because I think potentially unraveling this idea of the archive as a scholarly site and sort of giving it back to just normal people outside of academia and giving back this sense of interconnectedness is something that can be a strength, but it also can be a bit dangerous. Again, the idea of decontextualization, um, especially when it's often people sort of look at things in kind of a, a salacious voyeuristic way that, that does just reproduce the the marginalizing frameworks of the past. 
um, it's difficult and there's no easy answers, but I think often it's not about finding answers or solutions. It's about asking the questions and challenging ourselves and self-interrogating um, and just harm reduction a lot of the time. Mm -hmm. Are there are there ethical frameworks or protocols that you know of surrounding how people interact with archives? With regard to the medical records, it's solely about the idea of medical privacy, which is time based. So wow. there's a lot of records that are closed because um, in Victoria, I think it's 70 years after the record in New South Wales, it's 110 years. Um, often the idea is that you shouldn't be accessing something that's kept about someone who might still be alive. Um, but then mm -hmm. after someone dies, that doesn't mean sort of an abdication of responsibility to them. And often when they were killed by the asylum, people with intellectual disabilities in particular had awful life expectancies in the asylum. Um, the majority of them, I think 90% were children um, and like 40% died within a few years, not because of old age, but because of the conditions in which they were kept. Um, and there's really no, like the ethical framework that exists is the ethical framework of the state, which is itself not ethical. <laughs> um, mm. And there's really no sense of anything beyond that time-based access idea of closed records, open records, um, mm -hmm. and there's no, yeah, there's, there's really nothing. <laughs> hmm. Well, um, and uh, also, just quickly, um, for people listening, you can also, um, we'll get to questions at, towards the end, but you can ask us um, questions on Twitter using the hashtag uh, DWF19. And also there's like a chat bar, I think, that you can ask questions that we'll probably get to at the end. Um, but what I was going to ask you guys, uh, you both, is um, with, the, um, with the concept of the digital again, do you reckon the digital, like, this will be different because sort of this is like kind of what I feel like Lucas, your project is doing. Like, um, but me and Robin were previously talking about like the possibility of the digital's power for re like reclaiming your story, for um, being able to control representation. Because as like both me and Robin were talking about, like in many ways uh, through those sort of archives, someone else is controlling your narrative. And then even through secondary sources, Again, it's mostly these scholars that are accessing these collections and then writing about them. But a lot of times, again, they don't have connection to the community. So again, it's even like the most well-intentioned still comes from a different space. And um, they sort of, again, are just telling the story um, about you without you. Um, mm -hmm. so I'm wondering, uh, Lucas, what do you think about the digital um, space for, you know, to reclaim the story and to represent yourself? Mm -hmm. I have so much to say about that. Um, and I'm reminded actually of one of the, um, one of the things that led me to um, making Queering the Map was exactly, was in relationship to academia. So I, I guess maybe like four years ago, um, I remember writing an essay. I interviewed two of my friends, um, uh, both of whom are trans or gender non-conforming um, about the way um, that they dressed and we did interviews and we talked about clothing and, and, and performativity in relationship to, to gender um, and took photos with them, did interviews with them. They were, I mean, they were and are close friends of mine. And then I wrote this academic essay where I cut up the interviews and, and used um, theory to unpack the things that they were saying. And, you know, while it was a really interesting exercise, um, by the end of it, I realized that I had written this essay and I also had this documentation where they were speaking in their own voices, contextualized um, through themselves and their physical presence. And that was a much more powerful artifact than anything that I could have spun um, using 
academic language. And so it was this, it was, and that was sort of my, uh, uh, the beginning of a, of a significant disillusionment with academia um, and any sort of ethnographic practice or, or not any sort of ethnographic practice, um, but a, a, a sense of disillusionment. Um, and so Queering the Map very much came out of that, of like, what does it mean to, to or, or if it can an archive be generated by people telling stories in first person um, without the need to kind of contextualize those stories. And so that's also something um, that I think about a lot now and that I really um, struggle with in regards to writing and thinking about Queering the Map. Um, for the most part, I, I kind of uh, refuse to um, talk over or use the stories that have been shared as examples of anything, because there's something that feels, especially because they're set up in ways that are, while they are contextualized, they're also, they're also only glimmers and traces of a full experience. And so there's, and, and that's set up specifically to create a certain amount of opacity and privacy and safety around these kinds of stories. Um, and yeah, so I, so that, that's a big question that I, that I, um, struggle with, especially as other people approach me or do do writing on Queering the Map and try to analyze these stories, because I think that you can just read them and in many ways they do more work. They, they operate as chunks of theory themselves. Um, so that's, that's sort of that one answer to that question. Um, and then another um, in terms of thinking about uh, like unlocking repre like representation or strategies of representation. Um, I think it, yeah, I mean, I think because uh, queer and trans communities are, are, are and have been and continue to be objects of study um, that, that academia, uh, you know, gets a lot of pleasure for better and often worse um, studying um, thinking about an archive that is community generated in which our stories are being told by us for us um, with, I mean, still the possibility, like my mom looks at Queering the Map and that's really cool too. Um, she is not the, the primary audience, um, obviously, but it is also, it, it, it's cool that she, as someone who is outside of this community has a connection through, through me, um, is, is able to learn um, in a capacity that is not filtered, let's say, through something like watching Queer Eye. Um, yeah, some thoughts. Yeah, um, I remember hearing about Queering the Map years ago, and I had another look at it today, and it's just a beautiful, chaotic mixture of, um, you know, there's tags that are like, here's where I had my first kiss, here's where I came out as trans to my grandparents, and then there's people talking about the history of like anarchist bookshops and activism and Mardi Gras and, you know, the, um, the, the community, it's bringing it back to the community and intimacies and interpersonal relations um, and connections with space. And um, I think that is something that's really powerful. Um, I think often when it comes to records and the the organization of records often um with trans history they're still understood under the frameworks of people who are not trans so they're constructed um you know trans masculine people are organized under phrases like passing women female mm -hmm. husbands trans feminine people are organized under these ideas of like female impersonators which I think people think about as, again, as neutral and not as something that's perpetuating really harmful ideas about deception and, you know, invalidity and pathologization that is still very present today. Um, it's only in the, the newest upcoming edition of the ICD that transsexualism is no longer a mental disorder. Um, mm. So understanding the forms of organization, where they've come from, who they've come from, who they're for, what they're perpetuating, what their purpose is, I think is really important. And um, in my thesis, one of the things I'm going to be doing over the next few years is conducting 
ethnography, um, a community consultation with trans people to try and bring my community back into the project because um, trans people have been kept out of academia for so long in so many ways. Um, there's quite like, you know, an infamous history of like Jermaine Greer and Janice Raymond just outing and bullying trans women out of academia. Jermaine Greer, who studied at the University of Sydney, which is where I'm doing my PhD. Um, and I found it quite difficult at times navigating the assumptions of um, other academics. And I've found myself questioning my purpose because I also feel really disillusioned with academia because I think it is a marginalizing space that creates and perpetuates marginalization. And I find myself sort of thinking like, is this the right space to be doing what I'm doing um, when my purpose isn't to do it for cis academics, it's to do it for trans community. But if I can create pathways that make it easier for trans people to enter these spaces and for the spaces themselves to be less harmful, that's something that I feel quite strongly about. Mm -hmm. And um, that's interesting because I, I think along similar lines in, but I was, I always think about this one thing like, um, cause it's quite a, like, I truly believe in it, but it's also become like quite a buzzword, like the idea of decolonizing and a lot of people, like there's even a conference in next year called decolonizing the archive. And um, I went to a museum conference this year and nearly every paper had some variation of decolonize in their sort of thing. And I was thinking about like the idea of like, decolonizing or queering the archive or, or queering institutions like academia, if they're like, if they're actually built on exclusion, can they actually, can this actually um, take place? Like, and, but I was, but then also if you look at sort of like your work, Lucas, it's like your archive is kind of like, it's like the best version of like, cause I really, I do think archives do have power state archives obviously have power, but I think community archives have power too. And they are, I think archives for the people, by the people always is a very, um, very cool tool. Like um, it, is, <laughs> it is how you can, uh, like, as we were talking about previously, like how you may be able to control your representation or, or tell your stories because other spaces will probably exclude them or mm -hmm. filter them. So um, thinking about that, do you think, like your archive may that is querying the map is probably querying the archive by in itself existing. But I was wondering like the idea around querying academia or querying the archive and decolonizing the archive. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a, a fabulous, fabulous question. And I think that they are always necessarily intertwined practices, querying and decolonizing. Um, and specifically when, when they're applied to um, institutions, like you said, that are that are set up specifically to marginalize and exclude um, queer, black, trans, indigenous, um, differently abled folk. Is it a like is a sort of like reparative read possible? Um, and I'm not totally sure. I'm not, I don't like I yeah I don't know if. Um, if something like a queered institution or a decolonized institution can move further than uh, like a neoliberal institution, or if these acts of, of decolonization and queering need to be rooted in, in something that is more anarchist and something that is more rooted in, in, in truly breaking, like truly destroying something as the end goal. And that's not to undo sort of like the reparative work that needs to be done in the meantime for the, for, for the, for, um, in many ways for the bodies who's, the bodies who are most on the line. Um, but I, I am more and more convinced that these things need to be, need to be broken. And then in those pieces, we can build like rebuild, but not necessarily with rebuilding the same thing as the end. Like there's something, I think in, in the introduction to the undercommons, um, Jack Halberstam writes something that 
something about like the revolution will come in a form that we don't yet know exists or something or that that we have not yet seen um and i i really believe in in that like that is where i think these these acts and and, and in many ways these buzzwords um if they're not sort of like re re like reclaimed from institutions um I think that is where they ultimately go. Like they lead us to this beyond where we know that the thing that we're addressing needs to be broken. And we know that we want something after that. And then it might come from those pieces but we can't necessarily know exactly what that space will look like. Um, I have. Oh. No, go ahead. <laughs> I have um, deep skepticism and cynicism about the idea of changing the system from within the system. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not interested in changing or joining a marginalizing system or structure. I'm interested in unraveling it um, and in creating new possibilities outside of that structure. Um, and lost my train of thought. <laughs> um, where was I going with this? Oh, I think Nathan, um, you and I spoke briefly the other day about community projects like the Australian Lesbian and Gay Archive, which is in the process of changing its name. Um, and, you know, the Gary Foley Archive, the, the Brixton Archive, that's looking at the, the some of the Black British history of activism in that area. Um, and I think the point where we can move beyond the institutions is the point where we can maybe start getting some of the real work done or the point where, you know, I'm, when it comes to disability as well, there's a lot of talk about, you know, like access and inclusion. And I'm not interested in inclusion in a marginalizing structure. I don't want inclusion. I want justice for my community. And the perception of what that constitutes the institution itself can't conceptualize it at all. Um, and I really feel um, it's really stark when, when you're in a space and you're the only person of your marginality in a room um, because I don't feel like I'm you know, I'm, I'm building on the work of so many other trans and disabled people and activists and I want to give back to my community and that's what I'm interested in is my community and not in the structure itself. Awesome. I think we've only got like a minute or two minutes. So um, uh, I'm not sure if we've got any questions. I haven't seen any pop up which is cool because our conversation was pretty cool. Um, but if we don't have any questions, I was wondering, um, I'll like end with like how asking you, asking you to tell um, how people can find you and what you're, um, what you're doing going forward. Um, you can find me, uh, you can find Queering the Map um, at www.queeringthemap.com. Um, and also on Instagram at Queering the Map, also on Facebook at Queering the Map. Um, you can find me, Lucas, on Instagram as at Ontario.mom. Um, and you can also find me on my website, which I'm currently in the process of, of updating. Um, so maybe look like in two weeks. Um, <laughs> LucasLaRochelle.com. Um, oh, and then going forward, um, going forward um, with Queering the Map, my, my dream is to figure out essentially how to make it sustainable um, into the future. And a big plan for the sustainability is how to um, decentralize it and distribute sovereignty over the platform, because I don't think that um, it makes sense to have one, one, one me in general, but also one me located um, in a Western uh, angle, like Anglophone context, um, making all of the decisions for this platform. I think that it necessarily needs to be decentralized um, and the sovereignty over it needs to be distributed. So that's um, my, my highest goal um, for the next chunk of my life is figuring out how to make that happen. Cool, 100%. Um, 
Um, I'm on Twitter. I hate Twitter. Every time I'm on it, I want to delete it. <laughs> but I'm on Twitter at Robin Marceline. I have a website which has some of my poetry and scholarship and, and the bits and pieces up at uh, robinemmemes.org. Um, some of my art as well is up there. Um, and I'm going to be in a PhD hole for the next three years. <laughs> but, um, yeah, I've, I've been around at some of the, like, writers' festivals and stuff. I'll probably do more of that because I make bad life decisions. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but, yeah, I'm around. <laughs> cool. And I'll even do myself. So I'm at Say What Nathan on Twitter, and I run a blog called The Archival Decolors. So <laughs> I write about discussions like this, sort of, uh, um, and ideas around this, and sort of that's what I, that's my jam, and that's sort of what I do. So, um, and going forward, that's probably what I'll continue to do. So, um, do we just say goodbye? So, how's it going? <laughs> <laughs> Good talk. Thank you both of you for a wonderful yeah, is it the end for us also, like the live and goodbye. To, so nice to talk to you. If that's yeah, the case. That was awesome. This was. Um, yeah, it's awesome to meet you, Lucas, and it's always awesome to chat with Robert. So. Yes, yeah. yeah. Hopefully, we will um, come across each other in in okay. real life or digital life. <laughs> cool, cool. Have a beautiful day. <laughs> <laughs>